Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the second installment of the Fannie Mae in-house speaker series. This is an opportunity to invite guests to Fannie Mae to talk about some of the most pressing issues, some of the most provocative topics and innovative solutions in affordable housing. And we're really excited for today's conversation about the use of design in small spaces. So I'd like to invite our panelists to join me now. So sitting next to me is Chrysanthi Broik, uh, Broikos, thank yeah. you, <laughs> who is the curator at the National Building Museum. She recently uh, curated an exhibition called Making Room, Housing for a Changing America. And it focused on the use of, um, of, of the importance of options in housing and the types of um, flexibility and floor plans that make uh, uh, living in small spaces possible. And then also uh, joining us today is Sophie Wilkinson, who is the head of construction and design for Common, which is a New York-based property firm that helps create and market shared co-living spaces. Welcome to our guests. Thank you. Thanks. So, Kersanthi, I'll start with you. You were the curator for the Making Room exhibition, which closed in January but you were really um, very gracious with your time and gave me a private tour of the exhibition um, uh, last month. And so we had a film crew with us just by chance. So we got a little <laughs> video of, of what Krasanthi shared with me. So let's take a look. My name is Chrysanthi Broikis. I'm a curator here at the National Building Museum and I develop exhibitions like this one called Making Room, Housing for a Changing America. Not only do we need more housing, just in general, but we need the right kind of housing. And that is really what the exhibition is about, saying we, we need more flexibility, we need more options. The open house is about a thousand square feet and it amazingly really acts like much more than that, almost 2,000, I'd say. Okay. If you push this button, it's table height. Oh, very nice. This space here is actually a micro apartment. Oh. This is a product called a kitchen box. Oh, this is great. So you have a oh, sink. Oh, and it even has a cooktop. Yep. So this really could serve as a rental. Absolutely. The great thing here is you don't even have to take off, you know, anything from your bookshelf. I love it that. It comes right down also becomes your kitchen table. Oh, I love this. It's a great use of the space, which yeah. is why someone is able to live so comfortably in only 300 square feet. We're not really realizing that how technology in the bigger sense has changed things and made it easier for us to live in smaller spaces. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> So in, in the video, you really talked about the need for not only more, more housing, but housing that actually fits um, the way we're currently living. Can you talk a little bit more about the mismatch that we're currently seeing in the housing supply versus the demographics in the US? Sure. Um, and I think you've got some of those statistics out in the hallway I saw. So um, one of the premises of the exhibition was exactly that mismatch. So um, our partner on the exhibition was CHPC, the Citizens Housing Planning Council in New York, and they helped us crunch a lot of the numbers. Um, basically, the most households today, the highest percentage of households at 28%, 28% are single adults living alone. The second largest group is couples with no children at 25%. If you look at just those two top tiers, right, that's more than 50% of all households are just one or two people. But when we looked at what was the housing stock available, if you looked at the lowest ends, there's actually less than 1% are studios, and about 11.5% are one bedrooms. So even though we have 50% of the market, um, you know, are, are only one or two people, for if you're interested in a one bedroom or smaller, it's 12.5% of our housing stock. 
So that's what we mean by that's a really big mismatch, <laughs> which means that um, folks are being forced into housing and into bigger units, even if they don't want to be, right? And that means they're having to pay more because right. those bigger units cost more, which is why we're seeing this growth in, um, which is the third category, households, adults sharing with other adults, right? Um, that's 20% of the market. Um, and then the next, at, at that same 20% is nuclear families, what we traditionally think of as the typical household. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? The typical household is fourth on the list or tied for third. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, our perception of who we are is just not accurate anymore. That was accurate, you know, in the 1950s and 60s. Mm -hmm. But since the 70s, um, you know, basically those curves have changed. The, the nuclear family is going down and singles and all the other categories are going up. But where our housing stock has largely been kind of the old ways. We just have been repeating the old ways until very recently. We're now starting to see um, some change. Right. And I think, that, and that's what the exhibition was, was about. We really focused, um, in addition to the open house where we had that 1,000 square foot house and showed you how it could really be much more. Um, the, part, the last part of the exhibition had case studies from around the country where we just talked about all of the, all the differences and new innovations that we were seeing. Okay. And I think we'll get into some of that. Yeah, great. And Sophie, if you think about Common's place in the market, mm -hmm. Common is really trying to also address the affordability and the mismatch. And, but doing it a slightly different way, really leveraging co-sharing, co-living spaces. Can you talk a little bit about Commons model and why you all entered this space and who are some of your tenants? Yeah, sure. I mean, firstly, thank you so much for having us here. It's a pleasure yes. to speak to all of you. Um, Common is a brand in the rental housing space. We are property managers and we mm -hmm. specialize in co-living, this new model to solve this problem. How do we came about? You know, there's a real gap. There's a real gap between how people are living and the, pe and, and the housing stock that's available. So you see a lot of people that are earning good, a good salary and they don't have options that are enjoyable. It's almost a rite of passage to have a bad experience when you're looking for a rental property. <laughs> um, and then you find people roommating to solve this solution, which is a great way to get it yourself um, less rent burdened, but the roommate experience is also mm. risky. So we came about to say it doesn't have to be that bad. It can be enjoyable if you have people that are focused and in our case, a company that's focused on doing this well with the design focus there. Um, perhaps there's another way. Um, so the type of people that are living at Common is anyone that really, you know, is looking for an affordable option and isn't willing to sacrifice on a poor living space. And they, mm -hmm. as what Common does is we've taken what are the poor elements of living with roommates, let's eliminate some of the friction points there through operating and design, and then let's let the roommates enjoy the, the good parts of it. So, yeah. And I will tell you that the photographs um, that we're showing I had a chance to tour a couple of common properties here in DC mm -hmm. and they really do look as nice in person as they do in the photographs. So yeah. really high end features, really nice. And you don't have to worry about when your roommate moves out that they're gonna take the TV or the couch or whatever. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. all of that's yeah. taken care of. And it's, you know, a lot of people roommate and it doesn't have to be that bad. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so when you're thinking about, um, um, uh, the common, most common types of tenants, probably you are targeting younger adults, um, people just exiting college or an earlier in their careers. Is that the demographic you're typically seeing now at Common? Actually, no. So when we started, and we started in 2015, our first home was a row house in Brooklyn. Um, we definitely had the first movers. So we're exciting venture-backed company. We'd done something cool. We were featured in Wired and stuff. So we had millennials and people that were interested in trying the, the new thing. Then we went on an open home after home and we're really seeing how demand and demographic being as wide as the, the gap of people that are looking for affordable options. Mm. So it's very broad. It's older than people would expect. Our average age is 29. 82% okay. um, of people at Common have an office job, nine till five. They go into Manhattan or business centers um, and work there. So it's not all startups or 
yoga, yoga instructors or anything. Um, <laughs> they're, earning, they're earning good money, you know, good money. Um, you can earn like in the 70 grand mark, 50 to 80 grand is about where we see a lot of our um, uh, demographics sit sitting and those, that group of people is underserved. There aren't great options and people are delaying marriage, they're mm. putting off home ownership, they're uh, valuing experience and convenience higher and we're used to that in all aspects of our life, mm. Uber, right. you know how it goes. Um, so why in where you spend majority of your income are you experiencing and putting up with a bad, uh, a worse experience? So, right. Yeah. And I think some of the really other really attractive features about common are um, you have the the common areas are are serviced by others. So you have uh, cleaning services come in. They also stock toilet paper, paper towels, things like that. Yeah. So that also takes some of the burden and and um, stress out of living with others or roommates off. Totally. It's, yeah. It's just. Doing the things that have to be done, has, place has to be cleaned, instead of fighting about it, um, you have a company like us that operates it. Absolutely. We'll take care of that. Great. Um, so, Chrysanthi, we're um, taking a couple steps back and thinking about the broader market across the US. Where would you say are some of the most forward thinking states, cities that are looking at? Um, making it easier for us to have more affordable, flexible options uh, for living space? Um, we do see things across the country, but there is definitely in areas like New York and DC or San Francisco or LA where, there, where prices are high for housing, right? There's, um, there's more room for innovation in the marketplace for folks to carve out niche markets. Um, so we're seeing that, and I think that's um, exactly what you talked about. You know, there's there's kind of some sweet spots that developers are finding, where um, you know there's a price point between renting that townhouse, for example, mm -hmm. where you're not going to get your private bath um, or your private bedroom. I mean, you get your bedroom maybe, but right. not the bath, and the and the and the, the spaces are not built for multiple adults living in them. Right. Um, versus what you're, something like what you're talking about, um, where there's you know, something in between that going to a, a one bedroom or a, a studio that you, you can't afford by yourself. So it's still sharing, but it, it's, you know, there's a sweet spot in between those two things. Um, but we found, I would say, well, let me just say that there's, aside from sharing, I mean, sharing was probably the largest component of the exhibition. Then we also focused on smaller spaces as well as accessory dwelling units, which is obviously sharing the, the, the um, real estate in some way, um, not necessarily the home as the other big part of the exhibit. Um, and in that sharing space, there's actually um, co-housing, which is you know, one element. There's home sharing. There's, um, we saw some interesting things like uh, in Chicago, we found a, an unaffiliated university dorm that's catering to students from any university, right? Um, we found in Tucson grandparents, um, housing for grandparents who are taking care of their grandchildren. So, you know, really I'd say since the housing crisis or, you know, since 2008 and the financial crisis, um, there's just been this movement or, idea that we've got to try some new things. So we are seeing things <coughs> pop up everywhere. Outside of Boston, for example, um, I mentioned the home sharing. Because Boston has the highest concentration of, of colleges and universities, mm -hmm. um, there's an online group, this Nesterly, that is, is trying to match grad students with um, homeowners who have extra space in their home who are willing to rent out a room. So we're seeing, you know, <coughs> something like that. Now, home sharing has been around for a long time, um, but it hasn't been focused on specifically, you know, targeting grad students with um, homeowners. But home sharing, for example, where um, we featured a, a, a group from Los Angeles who was one of the pioneers in the late 70s, and their typical client um, 
is a homeowner, say, in their 80s who brings in somebody in their 60s or 50s who is looking to <coughs> share. So there's all, kind of <laughs> all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's really, in terms of this, why are there, you know, this large single population, um, as we were saying, it's not all young people. You know, there's a lot of divorced people out there, right. people who never got married, people who are separated, who are looking for housing, especially maybe temporary housing. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on out there. Yeah. And would you say, Sophie, for, for Common, as you're trying to address these different demographics, do the features or the, uh, the things that you offer change? Maybe if you're talking about people with differing abilities or older Americans, do the options that you offer in your properties change by, based on the demographics who live there? <coughs> I wouldn't say that you know, we're tailoring or building a product for a certain type of demographic in any way. I think that what we're building and creating when we partner with, so we operate the buildings and we partner with real estate developers. We're involved in the design and construction from the start. Um, what we're focused on is being able to deliver a great price point. Um, we always try and deliver 30%, 20% less than a studio in the area. Mm. Um, so that's a, that's a big jump down, um, and it acts it, it opens it up for you know the top the level that people can really can um, can afford to be at, um, and then just making sure that we're focused on the functionality of the space, regardless of what demographic you're in. Everybody okay. still has the same basic needs, and yeah. that's what we're trying to really get right. And it is put under pressure in a co-living situation, and that's why you need professionals that are really honing this in, which is what we're doing, and understanding that. You, we are creating a housing stock for that specific purpose instead of just taking what was the stock 30 years ago and trying right. to make it work and then they've got those friction points. So it's not demographic tailored at all, it's just use case tailored. Yeah. yeah. And how are you able to get it 20 to 30 percent below what is available in market? Because you guys are in some very high demand markets, yeah. New York, San Francisco, DC. How are you guys able to do that? Yeah, um, we're in six cities at the moment. Um, it's all about density. Square footage is expensive. What you can do with great design is trade excess space for a lower price point. You have to do that with expertise. Yeah. Um, we also manage the space so it, is, it operates. Um, in our management, we do everything from doing the services and the landlord functions to making sure the community is functioning well and playing a role in that because it is a lot of people living together. Um, but yeah, it's leveraging good design and good operations. And there's a lot of tech and there's a lot of feedback that's going on for us. So um, continuing to bring that information into the product and that's how you can, you can trade because it all comes down to the square footage and that's how you can get that affordable product out there while still maintaining a high quality of life and like an aspirational mm -hmm. living situation that is people's real lives. I mean, again, this isn't, renting isn't a, a thing that you're doing for a short time anymore and then trying to find your dream home. You're, you're a real person, you're a 30 year old professional living your real life, so you want your living space to be great. Um, you're making fine, you know, good money. Why isn't there a great place for you to live? And that's what we're trying to deliver, yeah. One of the things that I liked about the exhibition as well as what I see in the common model is, is thinking about the design and the importance of design, particularly when you have a small space and how can you make a 600, 800 square foot space feel two, three times larger based on how you actually design it. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of design? Well, I think you just did a little <laughs> bit, but yeah, I, I mean, everything um, really has to do double duty sometimes or you eliminate things that just, like hallways. <laughs> Challenge some uh, basic assumptions. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. in the open house, for example, we really didn't have any hallways. Um, and we had a lot of the transformative furniture which functioned as both, you know, your seating mm -hmm. and your bed. And even in the bathroom, um, you know, the vanities we had, for example, were, um, they had drawers, but we made sure that the ones we chose could have had removable drawers in case you needed, you mentioned, you know, de different demographics. In case, for example, if you had a wheelchair, right. then I don't have to change out my vanity, I'm just removing a drawer, for example. Or we had a shower where the walls literally folded back. So you get the space you need if you need it, and if you don't need it, it you know, something disappears. Um, and that countertop, that doubles as your kitchen table, right? So. Mm -hmm. 
everything, you know, you, you're rethinking everything. There were a lot of pocket doors, so storage is hidden in places or ab above in the trans in the um, in the bed that doubles as the seating. There's also storage embedded in those, and you can add that on the top or on the side. So. In a lot of them, there was actually more closet space than you would expect. Yeah. So that thousand square feet actually had a walk-in closet, two full bathrooms, um, and a laundry room in addition to three living spaces and the kitchen. So I mean, you can do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that was fitting that within you know a gallery, not even just a you know, <laughs> which was also you know had its own challenges but. and it had that very cool pull out shoe rack that right was, right that pocket door so was probably. don't worry if you got a lot of shoes you can make it work but i think that's been one of the you know one of the forgotten elements is design design can solve problems we just haven't really been we haven't focused on that mm -hmm. and i think we're now realizing that that really can make a big difference and i mean that's what i mean that's what the museum believes in obviously that could design can solve a lot of problems. Um, so this was really, I mean, this is why the exhibit for us was kind of a no-brainer. It was a, a natural fit. Absolutely, yeah. Anything to add in thinking about how Common really looks at design or approaches design in its space? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's design playing its function in its very most basic purpose, which is to solve problems. So sometimes design is spoken about as a luxury item is absolutely not in solving of problems. Um, the best design is the design that's unseen. You don't have to spend excessive money in your development to make some really great choices, mm -hmm. make some choices that really make a space um, a fantastic experience um, with training square footage. Also, of course, common leverage is sharing. So you don't necessarily need a study within your own personal square footage that you're paying for and renting for if you have access to space. And that's a huge trend that we're seeing across um, the globe basically is that shared economy, access over ownership. Can I have a space that I can share with 20 people and pay 120th of or whatnot? Mm. Um, and, and does that work for my needs? And the answer is oh, usually yes. You do not need a dining room table in Manhattan to entertain a dinner, dinner party, mm. but it would be nice to have a space to have some people <laughs> around. Um, and you can have that by sharing it with other people. So, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So a few of the things that you all have mentioned are things that are ideas that have been tried before, but now we've brought them back with a, some modernization, a, addition of technology. Looking forward, what would you say, what would you like to see in the future of housing? Um, particularly as we talk about use of space, design, um, what would you like to see in the future of housing? Well, we said always that everything, I mean, the future is now, right? Everything that, that I was mentioning, for example, is, is here and available today. I just think we're going to see more of it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that's one thing. I don't think there's anything. Um, we didn't show, I mean, and for the building museum, it was kind of important with this exhibition not to show future projects because you mm. never really know what's, what's going <laughs> to happen. And, and, the great thing was that you know everything we were able to feature was in the United States, and the show. Um, I should say that CHPC had partnered with the Museum of the City of New York to do an exhibition on the same topic, focused on New York in 2013, and they couldn't show things in New York at that time. I mean, it was it was there wasn't anything at, at the scale that we're talking about now so just mm. in the last five years things have really changed and our exhibit opened in 17 and just in those four years we saw a huge turnaround so that exhibit actually featured a lot of work from japan oh, wow. um, and we didn't have to do that we didn't have to use anything because there's so much that's really happening now um, i would say that one thing that that um, we're seeing change in as well in addition to the to the design side is some zoning changes mm. um, and that's happening everywhere too I mean I live in Montgomery County and they're right in the process now of changing their ADU regulations and we've seen that a lot I'd say maybe that's one of the most common zoning changes that's going on um, jurisdictions making it um, a lot easier potentially to build an ADU. Um, some states are even in, 
getting into the game with making blank, like California, for example, has a new, new law that says local jurisdictions can no longer exclude ADUs, which you know a number of smaller jurisdictions had done that. So states are now getting into the game by trying to um, regulate that. Um, in Virginia, for example, you can have a medical ADU or a short-term ADU for medical purposes. So again, that's a state, the state telling you know a local jurisdiction that you have to allow something. Would that be, it's a temporary structure? Um, yes, so for example, um, if you wanted to say your, somebody in your family, um, maybe your mother or mother-in-law, you know, if you want that in-law suite, as it were, you can have one in, in, in your backyard now. And there, we actually found a company in Virginia that will, um, they basically have a prefab unit that you can purchase and put up in the backyard. You have to get a medical doctor to sign off on the, on the need and it has to be certified. Um, and then say that medical need goes away, whether the person gets better or perhaps they pass, this company will actually buy that unit back. Oh. Um, so it truly is temporary, you know. Um, so they're finding, their companies are finding all kinds of ways to, you know, to get around yeah. <laughs> the current regulations. Um, I have to say, even we also featured um, Portland, Oregon, which has probably the country's most um, liberal laws on ADUs, and even they have made significant changes over the last um, couple of years, primarily because even though you may make it easier for people to build an ADU, it still requires money. It's right. still expensive yeah. to do. I mean, it's a, you know, it's an addition basically in some cases. Um, and it was only after they um, waived a lot of the mm -hmm. infrastructure impact fees that they were charging to about uh, an average of about $10,000 that they actually saw a big jump in people actually applying for the ADU permits. So you may make it easier, but that still doesn't necessarily mean people are gonna do it. That's right, yeah. Um, yeah, one of the projects that we're funding in West Denver actually has streamlined the process to make it easier, more affordable, mm -hmm and also just to educate people to walk them through the entire process from the construction to actually finding a tenant. And that, right. that's what's gonna make it uh, more popular. We featured another one like that in Austin, the Austin Alley Flat Initiative, where um, this is a bit of an older project, but the University of um, Texas at Austin started this, where they actually came up with a catalog of, of designs for, AD, for backyard ADUs and if um, then they were able to partner with the city and some local neighborhoods. And if you agree to um, use one of the pre-designed ADUs, they will help um, speed you through the process, mm -hmm. lower some of the fees. Um, and you, however, have to agree to rent to somebody who has um, an a, mm -hmm. a, you know, AMI of a certain income level. And you also have to pledge that you won't charge them more than 30% of their income. Mm -hmm. After five years, however, it doesn't have to be affordable. In that sense, you can charge whatever you want. So the city is guaranteeing themselves a fairly steady supply um, of affordable units. That's great. Mm -hmm. Sophie, what do you think? What's the future of housing? What would you like to see? I think that the future of housing <coughs> is going to leverage entrepreneurial companies to push to push uh, push the housing stock in the direction that we really need to see. We know that there's massive trends about people moving towards city centres. It's going to get m under more pressure. Um, and then you have companies like ourselves that are constantly innovating. We are looking at the latest stuff. We're leveraging things like data and information. And we're starting to push governments and we're starting to see that response as well. You know, Share NYC is a new um, mm. initiative launched by New York, um, which is basically open the doors to say, we understand that sharing is happening. Let us partner with businesses and companies. Um, the deadline for that submission actually is today. today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we put ours in and I'm sure we'll be the winners. Um, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's fantastic. That's the city of New York saying, look, we need to, we need to partner here. You're pushing it. Let's talk together and mm -hmm. let's help solve this problem 
as a, as a partnership, which I think is fantastic. We're also partnering with um, Dan in New Orleans. We're doing an affordable, yeah. affordable um, building, which is really fantastic because when you have that government support, you get that extra ability to access other, other groups as well. So I see companies pushing innovation forward there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think there's the future of housing does have a social element. Mm -hmm. So people mm -hmm. are lonely in these dense cities. They are, it's ironic, but it's true. Um, you have this counterculture around this digital socialising where people are going back to saying, I actually am lacking real connection in my life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a huge driver for what we see people wanting to come and live at Common is to have a community outside of their work community, outside of their digital community. Um, and so building housing stock that supports that and brings that social aspect back into the neighbourhoods um, and the city centres is really fantastic as well. So I, I do yeah. see that as a part of the future as well of housing. It's, it, the lived, lived environment plays a huge role in the energy and the socialness of a city. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting because oftentimes we think about social isolation with older adults, mm. but it's really any, at any age, um, mm -hmm. particularly if, if we're kind of cut off by technology, mm -hmm. yeah. One thing we didn't talk about is the use of technology at Common. I know you guys have some really interesting things that you've been able to incorporate into your properties. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about what you've done? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, um, there's some fa fantastic, again, companies innovating that we're obviously talking to all the time. Um, everything from Wi-Fi being supplied as a utility, the same as water. I think that mm. most people can agree that you, you it's part of one of the, it's, almost becoming a, an essential item for survival. Yeah. So we provide utility, we provide Wi-Fi and gas, water, electricity, all part of the one bundled rent, nice. um, which is still the 20% lower. Yeah. Um, we do smart locks, so you don't have physical keys. Again, that's a design factor when you have roommates living. You wanna make sure that security is, is at the highest um, uh, level. And then there's a, there's a massive element in making, even finding your apartment is a difficult process. Um, so all of that is now automated online with us leveraging technology. Um, signing your lease and updating your lease and whatnot's there. Um, as well as all of the data and information we use to drive our design. So instead of just um, figuring it out, we're really powering that with a lot of information, iterating, being a vertically integrated company, being that mm. the designers are the same company that then go on to manage it forever. Um, we're very vested in it being a, a well done job um, and leveraging data in really interesting and innovative ways there as well. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. And then the, yeah, the, the, the marketing element as well when you can have a brand promise, which obviously is what Common's doing um, and leveraging technology to be able to make sure that your, your actual solution is reaching the people that is, it's marketed for, so. That's yeah. right, yeah, absolutely.